To wander on one of the islands in the early morning light, or to sail by night on the waters of the bay, how wonderful this landscape is. The words of a Vietnamese king in the 13th century, profoundly impressed by the bizarre island world of Halong Bay. Everyday routine for fisherman Ngoyen Van Nan. Often he sets out by night with his grandson, son or son-in-law to cast his nets at first light, sometimes in the rain, sometimes in early morning mist. Nan comes from the village of Tobo Nao. At 74, he's the oldest man in the village. He spent his whole life here. Many of the islets have no names on the nautical charts, but he knows them all. Saddle is the name the fisher folk give to one of the islands, simply because it looks like one. There's another called chopstick, or sometimes stylus. In the interior of some of the islands, there are lakes, often quite round, set in stately cliff walls. They are seawater lakes, some of them accessible by boat through cave tunnels, a miracle of nature, and ideal shelter for the fishermen. When the rain becomes too heavy and gusts of wind whip up the waves, or worse still, a typhoon blows up from the South China Sea, the fishermen seek the shelter of the islands. A calm bay, an overhanging cliff, a cave. Old Nan and his people prefer this cave, even when all they want is to take a break. It's called Hang Trong. Trong means open to both sides. When the fishermen are sitting together, it's not long before they start telling stories about the many caves they've clambered around, about events, some true and some made up, in ever-changing versions. Old Nan's favourite story is the tale of Ha Long, the descending dragon who gave the bay its name. A long, long time ago, the dragon was sent by the gods to shape the islands and bays, and he defended the Vietnamese against enemies from the north who got lost in the confusion of islands and were sent packing by the dragon with powerful swishes of his great tail. That's also what produced the deep cuts and the many caves, what gave this unique scenery its jagged edges. The dragon, it's said, lives out at sea to this day. At least that's what Nan believes. And no ship, he says, no matter how big, can withstand him when he whips up the wind, the thunder and the lightning. There are 2,500 islands in Halong Bay, an ancient geological formation in the north of Vietnam. They're the remains of limestone beds laid down 300 million years ago. They remained even when the Vietnamese mainland was raised from the sea much later. Over a period of millions of years, the limestone formations took on grotesque shapes. The sea level rose and fell as warm periods and ice ages came and went. The wind and the waves played their part, and so these bizarre shapes really do look like the work of some ancient beast of fable. The fishermen are on their way back to Tobo now. Mm. 
they have to round just one more rocky promontory and then they're home. Tobor now is a small fishing village, but no ordinary one. It has no harbour and no road running along the shore. Indeed, it has no roads at all. Tobol now is one of the floating villages of Halong Bay. 300 villagers live in these watery settlements on boats with bamboo roofs or in floating houses. Some are boat people here, uprooted Vietnamese refugees who've returned to their homeland. Most, though, are long-established resident fisherfolk. Nan's family has been here for four generations. Come here, come here, come here. The old man lives with his family in a small houseboat. It has an altar to their ancestors, a bit of storage space and a few square meters of living space, half covered, which also serves as kitchen and bedroom. That is their entire kingdom. Nan remembers how several times they've been urged to leave their floating village beneath its sheltering cliff and settle on dry land. The last occasion was when Halong Bay was declared a protected World Heritage Site. But they chose to stay on their ancestral waters. These days their presence is tolerated. After all, their local knowledge and experience are useful to the environmental protection authorities. The floating villages are always in well-protected bays and they're never far from large caves into which the villagers can withdraw when a typhoon threatens. Most of the islands are too rough and steep to be habitable. Since Halong Bay was declared a World Heritage Site, there's been a general ban on settlements and construction. As a result, the flora and fauna can develop undisturbed. The biodiversity is nothing less than luxuriant. It's ideal territory too for numerous tropical land and seabirds. Herons, pheasants, parrots and eagles. Richer still is the underwater world of Halong Bay. 160 species of coral have been identified to date. The warm climate and the large quantities of plankton create a veritable paradise for more than a thousand species of fish. Time and again, the fishermen catch ocean-going fish never usually found in inshore waters. Here, though, they feel at home among these jagged inlets. Crabs and prawns in abundance, and the ray is also considered a delicacy. And yet, this biodiversity is threatened. Major shipping routes run straight through the island group, while the coast is lined with industrial cities. And there's something else too, coal. For the fisherfolk of Tobo now, this is an alien, polluted world. Since the end of the 19th century, when the French arrived as colonial masters, huge quantities of coal have been removed from open cast mines, seven million tons a year. For a hundred years, environmental protection was not an issue, and the edges of the bay were polluted by a slurry of coal dust and effluent. Today, a start is being made on proper waste management. The coastal towns are beginning to build sewage treatment facilities, not least because of the growing numbers of tourists. A first step towards preserving this piece of world heritage. Ten kilometers offshore, in Tobo now, the water is clean. The livelihoods of the fishermen depend on the quality of the water more today than ever before. Because for some years they've been building floating houses, the special thing about them is their basement, so to speak. In these cages and nets is a new source of income, and for many it's now their main source. The Unguians too not only catch fish, but increasingly breed them including small sharks, which fetch $7 a kilo. And there's something else new. Around midday, boats arrive with day-trippers. Since Vietnam opened up to the outside world and Halong Bay was declared a World Heritage Site, the number of visitors has exploded. It's now past the million mark. More and more foreigners are coming, especially from neighboring China. 10 to 20 boats a day more at Sung Sut Cave, not far from the village, a grotto of truly cathedral dimensions, one of the great tourist attractions of Halong Bay. 
And what would Halong Bay be without the image of gently gliding junks which adorns every tourist brochure? Until a few years ago, they were still numerous, but most have been scrapped as part of a process of modernization and mechanization. They disappeared almost overnight. They've gone. The big red sails are only hoisted on a few upmarket examples preserved for the tourists. The pace of change is a matter of concern for the people of Tobol now, as are the relative advantages and drawbacks of the tourist trade. It's a sensitive issue. For a few years they earned a tidy sum by selling corals. The tourists coughed up for pretty pieces, but as the coral reefs were demolished, the spawning grounds for the fish disappeared. No one had thought of that. As a result, diving for coral was strictly forbidden. That hit the fishermen hard, though some, including old Nan, had long had their doubts about the trade. The nature reserve authorities offered the fisher folk compensation in the form of tax exemption and by allowing them to sell their prawns, crabs and fish to the tourists. In return, they have to clear up the mess left by the visitors. The fisher folk have realized that they need to protect the foundation of their livelihood in order to preserve this unique island world in that archaic beauty which was praised in verse by a 15th century Vietnamese king. Hundreds of currents flow round the mountains, scattered islands, a chessboard of the sea which is joined to the heavens.